<laughs> All right, but first we're going to press on with chapter 12. So um, we had said, uh, I think we finished where we were talking about submodularity uh, and saying, okay, well, some cost functions are better for us when we're using graph cuts than, than others. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a nice cost function, we've got uh, quadratic costs, but it, it's actually a very straightforward case, and you've seen this kind of example already. This was a foreground uh, segmentation or background subtraction uh, situation. So I've just jumped to the end of the slide. You can grab a chapter 12, sure, guys. Um, so previously we'd said, okay, you might have a static camera watching a scene, video camera, get multiple frames. Maybe you take a bunch of frames that you know don't have anyone in them. And you use them to build up. Do you remember what we built up per pixel? What kind of model? Uh, mixed Gaussian. We said we could build up either a plain Gaussian or a mixed Gaussian. A mixed Gaussian, we said, would be even better than a plain Gaussian. Uh, but at each pixel location, we're saying we have some statistical model uh, so that we can maybe uh, classify uh, what is the probability of W equals foreground given some RGB value that we that we observe there. And if we do that for every pixel independently uh, for this frame, right, this might be the, the result that we get. So every pixel completely independent of all of its neighbors. But now we know better. Now we know that for uh, situations where we expect some kind of spatial smoothness prior on the world state, we're not expecting a prior on, on the feature space, right? Neighboring pixels in the background might easily have very different colors, right? The railing, the, some things are painted dark, some things are painted bright. We're not expecting smoothness on that. We're just imposing a prior on the smoothness of the labels that most things don't appear as a single pixel uh, foreground in the middle of a sea, an ocean of uh, background. So by imposing that prior, uh, we can get this kind of result, right? So here we've got some sort of pairwise uh, cost that's higher than the um, a pairwise cost that, sa that says, oh, it's more costly to put two pixels next to each other that are of different states. A and so what you should be seeing is this looks like a more cleaned up version, although you might still criticize it and say, well, actually, yeah, maybe I didn't want this person's shadow. It's sort of, um, it's actually more of a reflection, actually. Right, right there on the ground, which is causing all of those pixels to have a very high unary cost and unary affinity for being foreground. And of course, this, this regularization, right, the graph cut isn't going to make that go away, but it will smooth it out so that we don't have lots of straight pixels anymore. All right. So in a very similar fashion, uh, we can do segmentation where maybe we don't have a background model. But now this is tricky. If we don't have a statistical model of the background, and we never had a statistical model of the foreground, we were just setting it to some uniform distribution, uh, then how are we going to segment the, uh, the llama from the rest of the scene? Well, if I told you, if I told you the uh, pixel <coughs> model for foreground for the llama, if I said, oh, I'm going to train uh, somehow, I'm going to train this mixture of Gaussian's model for llamas, and here I'm going to give it to you, right? Well, then it would be easy for you to perform the segmentation. So that's, that's sort of, this is, a, this is the chicken in the chicken and egg, right? And if I give you the egg and I say, well, I could give you the segmentation, then you'd say, brilliant, with the segmentation in hand, I can build a reasonable color model of llamas. Okay, but you have one and you have the other, and you don't, you don't actually have either of those pieces of information initially. So there's no magic here. We have to get some information. And here the user is providing this information. The user draws a big bounding box around the llama uh, and says, outside of this box is definitely background. Okay. For now, let's just assume that inside is foreground. And so with that initialization, it attempts to alternate between building a likelihood model for pixels being part of the llama. And then when it has that, 
it tries to do a segmentation. And when it does the segmentation and it finds a smooth boundary for the segmentation, it then goes back and refines its color model of the lump. So by going back and forth, iterating a few times, it's able to, to take that red initialization and turn it into this segmentation, which is great, fantastic. Uh, and this, for that reason, this is now uh, actually built in apparently to the newest, well, I think even 2010 version of uh, PowerPoint. Right, so this was done at Microsoft Research um, in Cambridge. And the whole thing, when, when, when it came out, and so I know the author, so he, he wouldn't take it too personally. He said, really, they got a paper out of that? All they did was use graph cuts for segmentation. We knew you could do that. And they said, yes, but we put a nice interface on it, and look, you know, llama. <laughs> <laughs> and the company loved it. The, the reviewers loved it. It got a big, you know, very, very famous paper now, very well cited. Um, and it's part of a product, which if you're a research group doing computer vision, productizing is, is uh, a, a great way for, to, to ensure job security. It doesn't always work. It works pretty well, but it doesn't always work. So if you have a situation like this and you might, might not get the answer you want, uh, you can always go back and put another sort of annotation on something and label a bunch of pixels. And the way it works in the context of what we've been talking about is very simple. By, by scribbling on a few pixels, you don't have to do like a, a Photoshop, you know, careful kind of lasso. You just, just indicate a few pixels, basically stab a few pixels and say, these are foreground. Please force them to be foreground. Or alternately, you know, if the, if the error, if the mistake is that it has uh, included something in the background as part of the llama, right? Or uh, as part of the child, you can stab those pixels and say, you no, know, these have to be background. Now, how do you imagine that that constraint that the user is telling the system could be imposed using our Markov random fields that we've learned about? How would you convert that user input that says this pixel should be foreground and get the graph cuts to respect that? Yes? If you put the, um, the pairwise costs of everything outside, or the crossing of that boundary, the pairwise cost is huge. So you're on the right track, but why did you choose the pairwise cost? I've stabbed uh, uh, five pixels. <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the answer should now be obvious. If, if it's not the pairwise <laughs> cost, then it's the <laughs> unary cost, right? So you, you, you crank up the unary cost for those pixels and say, I don't care what likelihood is coming out from my mixture of Gaussian calculation. The unary cost <laughs> of making these pixels anything other than foreground, right, uh, is infinite. These are, these have got to go with foreground. And then because those are sort of polarized permanently to be foreground, the naturally existing pairwise terms already say, well, okay, but you know, I, I have to make you agree with your neighbor, and if you're going to insist on being foreground, then your neighbor is going to potentially insist on being foreground, uh, un unless there's really very strong unary evidence against it, right? So your, your little stab pixels, forcing them to be foreground, will sort of propagate further out to, to further pixels. Um, but not, not unreasonably so, right? It shouldn't sort of bleed out all over the screen. It should actually just be, be sort of focused on the pixels that are nearby that still have either questionable or unary costs that are favoring foreground. Yes? So um, we did the card example. There was two colors there. Here's a lot more colors than two. How do you translate that to be that? Uh, so you're, you're anticipating the next slides, but, you're, but your, your question is, uh, let's say the, the question is easily answered here. We have two states of the world. World is zero, world is one. The fact that we have multiple colors impacts, does it impact the prior, our Markov random field prior? Or does it impact our likelihood, which is comparing pixels and world states? Probably the likelihood. Probably the likelihood. So if we have a likelihood, if we have a way of, of computing uh, probability of x given w, Right, probability of seeing this kind of color, given the world state uh, foreground, then it just has to be. If we're and we're doing mixtures of Gaussians, for example, then whichever 
color, I'm, I'm, whichever pixel I'm looking at, I'll basically compare it to my mixtures of Gaussians and say, well, I've got a mixture of Gaussians. What uh, should we say? One of them, there's a Gaussian sort of centered on red hair, on red. There's, an, there's another Gaussian centered on sort of blue, and another one on, I don't know, on beige or something. So as long as one of those Gaussians in the mixture says, oh, yeah, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take responsibility for that color pixel, then the likelihood will be fairly high. And, and that's the unary term sorted. Yeah? Um, then it comes back to the overall optimization, two states, foreground or background. It just says, it doesn't care about colors. It doesn't care about data. It just says, what, what is a good place to cut? I need to reconcile all of these conditional independences together to, to come up with the final segmentation. So all these pixels now, this is the optimal configuration based on some model of the likelihood. And of course, as we said here, we would, we would iterate a few times back and forth, updating the likelihood, uh, computing the, co the segmentation, update, compute. One more thing I'll say before I'll go to the failure example. One more thing is we, we said, oh, maybe you get a pairwise term that's handed to you. Maybe you learn it on some data. There, there, there can be quite a bit of smarts in the pairwise term. Someone asked me yesterday, um, I forget who, I'm sorry if the pairwise term could be different for different parts of the image. Uh, absolutely, you're, you're allowed to make it very different if you have some reason to, to do so. Uh, and one thing that happens in, in GrabCut actually is that they are, uh, they are making a pairwise term which, so my answer still stands, but the pairwise term cheats. It looks at the data, at the two pixel colors, and it says, you know, if you guys, if you two pixel colors are similar, then uh, I'm going to assume that your pairwise term should be lower. You don't, uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to have, um, sorry, backwards. If you two, if the two pixel colors are similar, then the pairwise cost is higher. You two should, are similar, so you should end up having the similar state. Right? If the two pixel colors are different, so in other words, we're talking about something where there is uh, potentially like a visual boundary, like some kind of you'd almost call it an edge, right? A difference between the two intensities. Then the pairwise cost says actually because you're two different colors, I I'm going to be okay with you two taking two different world states. So this in this way, we're we're defining uh, this pairwise cost to be slightly data dependent. Right? So it's not quite a CRF for those who know what that is, uh, but it's in that direction. Okay, so there's still sort of more to be said about pairwise, designing good pairwise terms, um, but we, we'll, we'll press on for now. There's the, the, the last example with the tree. The user has put in a, a, a box around it. Um, it hasn't really worked out super well. Based on what you've seen yesterday in particular, um, what do you think is the problem? The algorithm ran correctly, but this is the result. The tree isn't really smooth itself. It's not smooth. So we're, we're trying to apply the smoothness prior on something that's not particularly smooth. Um, so it is enforcing so that neighboring pixels will have the same world state. That, that part worked. <coughs> but the idea of switching from tree to not tree to tree to not tree over and over again, right, in this very intricate pattern, is very much against the philosophy of, of our prior, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't work out very well here. So this type of thing is actually a real problem for graph cuts. And the other thing that, that uh, the other failure that you'll see if you use the, the graph cut implementation or or anything sort of similar to it, uh, you can have problems with protruding objects. Because if you have a thin structure, a thin object often in your image somewhere, then it'll be a very similar situation to this. It will see that, oh, OK, uh, either, let's say this is a, is that a vacuum cleaner? This is sort of, so let's, let's trace out this. Uh, this vacuum cleaner, there's roughly, that's the uh, shape of a child. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> so that's that's what's left. Uh, the, the the graph cut is going to come along and say, okay, I need to segment. I need to, to compute a total cost, right? Uh, which is going to be optimal, as low as possible. Uh, and for all of these pixels, maybe there's really not a lot to be said, uh, right? These pixels have a strong unary cost. They, they like being foreground and so on. Uh, same thing goes here uh, and here. And then here it says, okay, remember, because it's looking at all the variables at the same time, right? That's the point of this graph. And here it says, well, now I could make, I could pay all of these boundary costs where one pixel, the inside one would be W1, the outside one would be W0, so I just pay all these boundary costs, or I could just cut it off right there, right, yeah, sort of, sort of uh, amputate whatever is left there, and pay, okay, so I, I maybe upset a few local pixels where the unary cost was quite high. They were saying, look, I'm part of the vacuum cleaner, and the pairwise terms said, yeah, that's fine, but look at all of this cost savings, right? And so these, these types of uh, thin structures are very hard for graph cuts to capture. And so um, one of the uh, one of the previous mas one of the master's student in, in the CGI course uh, went on to do her PhD, and one of her papers was uh, one of her papers here was how to try to deal with these thin structures with a little bit extra user user input. Okay, now we're not going to spend the whole time talking about applications, um, but we will think about the stereo one. We said last week when we did dynamic programming, we said, oh, you do every pixel independently, you get a very noisy stereo reconstruction, right? Remember this problem, we'll have not this one, but you actually have two images similar to, you know, one this and the other one is similar to it, and you try to compute. What were we doing? Remember, not actually depth, but Disparity. We're saying, okay, how far, how much has the pixel moved horizontally? Um, so if we have a bunch of discrete disparities, right, and we treat each pixel as part of a line, then we were able to do dynamic programming. But we said, oh, maybe we can do better if we can deal with grids. So indeed, we want to be able to deal with grids. Except, what's the problem now? From what I've shown you so far. When we can have world state w equals zero and world state w equals one, how do we do disparity? So you see, so what's that? N world states. We have to have multiple world states. We have to have this this categorical distribution over world states. Because uh, just two isn't going to cut it. We'd only have sort of again, maybe near and far, or big disparity and little disparity. And that's not enough if we're going to have this, these complicated scenes. So we have to jump back in the slides now. This, this is where we, we go back in your notes to introduce the idea of multi-label MRS. All right. And this is still the exact solution. So we, we are dealing with a cost function which is well-behaved. Uh, so it's um, maybe a quadratic cost function. And just like we had said previously for dynamic programming, where we said, okay, uh, you know, imagine a graphical model. Uh, we had said there's a chain, right? And we said, okay, expand that individual node to be this big version of the node. And we called them, I was calling them bubbles or individual states. Right? So we were saying, okay, this is W1 equals 1, this is W1 equals 2, this is W1 equals 3 or 4, right? So the same concept is happening here. The exact same, you should be picturing this just like we did for the dynamic programming. We sort of unwound a single random variable into a collection of nodes here, right? vertices in this graph. So we're going, to, we're going to be using graph cuts here, the same one we've been using all week. It's great. The only thing is that we have to connect these, these nodes in a very particular way. In dynamic programming, we didn't really worry about flow of water or anything like that. So these little nodes were all independent of each other and 
uh, we didn't have to worry. Now we're saying, okay, for we have two. This is a two-pixel setup, right? So this is pixel A. This is pixel B. <coughs> pixel A could be take value A1 or A2 or A3 or A4. Uh, A5 is actually uh, fake. We don't we don't allow an A5, but we have to have this node here nonetheless because just like we've been doing, we have to attach a source of the flow of the water going into each A1 or B1 or if we had C and D, etc. And we have to have at the bottom, there's an arrow pointing down, another one pointing down. At the bottom of all of them, the last flow goes into the sink. Now, interestingly, we said, well, there's a unary cost associated with each choice, right? With A1, with A2, with A3. So the unary cost for uh, pixel, pixel A being uh, set to W equals 1 is UA1. That is the cost that we put on this downward pointing arrow. For UA equals 2, that's the cost, and so on for UA4. We said A5 is just there for convenience. Sure enough, we have an infinite cost from the source to A1, and we have an infinite cost from A5 to the sink. In other words, when I come along here uh, with the, uh, the solution to the graph cut, right, I can cut in all sorts of places, but I can't cut here, I can't cut here. And the same, I can't cut across the top. To make sure that we don't try cutting and cutting back, all of the upward pointing arrows have infinite costs here. So this is this constraint that's, that's being introduced. Right, so now we're, we're starting to engineer the graph so that when you solve your uh, max flow min cut problem, you're simultaneously getting the answer to the, the optimal solution for this pair of random variables. So we've got unary costs. Now we need to put the pairwise costs somewhere. Right? Clearly, they're going to be here in the middle somewhere. So let's just show the, uh, the generic case, right? If you, did, if you didn't have these infinite cost back arrows, you'd be able to sort of cut off a node, uh, and then you wouldn't be able to, to say what state is B in, right? But as it, this is, so this is an invalid cut, right? This is a crazy cut that's not possible because of our infinite weighted edges. But in general, the same procedure applies because this cut cuts through UA4. That means we're saying A gets state 4 out of the possible discrete labels that are, that are available. All right, now, the pairwise costs. CAB, 1, 2. So that's this, this inter-variable cost between a pixel A and a pixel B. That's, and the 1 and 2 are indicating that A would get a 1 and B would get a 2, right? That's why those are the arguments there. So CAB12 equals this combination of pairwise costs. It says, look at the pairwise costs between A and B. And whatever your I is, you're going to use that repeatedly, except it might be I, I plus 1, I minus 1. And whatever the second argument J is, you're going to use that here as well, J minus 1 or J. So we have an equation, right? This should look very similar to what we did previously when we said, okay, let's, well, I can probably go back. When we said this, right? We said, ah, right. For our version of submodularity where we are making sure that our cuts are meaningful, we had to introduce this PAB minus PAB11 minus PAB00, right? So that is the same thing happening here, but now for the multi-label multi -label case. When dealing with this, right, you might have j minus 1. What do you do? You would, say, you would ask if j is 1. Well, the answer is um, here's the pairwise cost for things paired with 0. It's 0. Or the other one paired with 0. That's 0. Or if ever we need to go k plus 1, that's also going to be 0 and 0. OK, so we, we sort of define these special cases as all having a pairwise cost of 0. We now have an equation for our intervariable 
costs. So all of these all of these gray lines are calculated in this way. And so now when the graph cut gives you a cut, a solution, you can now interpret that. Uh, so uh, it's all a little bit high for, for my short arms. Um, a cut that comes in like this with the dotted line, right? Because it's cutting unary cost A1, then that's already telling us that the final solution here is saying, yep, yeah, pixel A is in state 1. Because the cut comes down through here and cuts through B3's unary cost, that means pixel B is in state 3. Okay. The neat thing is that because of the layout of the arrows, this one is connected not to, A1 is not connected to B1, but it is connected to B2, B3, B4, and B5. And that sort of continues. A2 is never connected to any B above it, but it is connected to the one across, and then down, down, and down. So because of this special layout of, the, of these pairwise costs, right, you will see that the cost total for every cut uh, produces the right thing. So here we are in fact paying, if this is the solution, then you can read off the graph cut. We are indeed paying the unary cost of making A1, the unary cost of making B3, and the pairwise cost of making A and B, the 1, 3 combination. It works out that way because our CAB14 and CAB15 are the right values based on that equation. And the interesting thing is that the, the overall structure, this, this layout of the edges, is set up so that uh, you cut, um, let's see, you cut from, when you have a cut here, you will end up cutting all the pairwise costs of the A's higher than the one you've chosen, and you'll cut all the B costs lower than the one you've chosen. So the, the maximum number of, so remember, we're always going for lowest cost, right? But how many different edges got cut? Well, the maximum number of edges you might cut is if you give A this highest value, A, K equals 4 in this case, and if you paired it with B1, so the, if this went all the way up um, and crossed and cross, cross through here. And in this, in this breakdown here, maybe it's very small, so it might be hard to see, it's telling us, yeah, indeed, it's taking UA4, which is the unary cost A4, UB2, the unary cost B2, plus this double sum. This double sum is saying, okay, look at, go for the A states, go from, uh, go from, the smallest A to the A that you reached, so we picked four in this case, and this is the loop over B, so this is saying go from three to five, CAB. That double sum ends up giving you PAB for two. So it looks like magic, this has all worked out, uh, but this was, let's say, a, a fair bit of effort uh, over the past few years that people have figured out Oh, good, I can have a multi-label framework, and as long as I define my cost functions in this way, then I'm actually computing the right, the right solution for my combination of, of costs. All right, so <coughs> um, there's a little bit left here to do in that when we introduce this, we saw this was a pairwise cost plus another pairwise cost, but this subtraction is happening. And what's the problem with that? We need, we need to add an alpha term to um, prevent a negative cost. Exactly. We have we we are in danger of having negative costs, so we need to add. We need to do a, a, a parameterization. Uh, this is just a proof of what I was saying a moment ago. So to introduce the alphas, what we do is we transfer over some of the CAB costs, the more expensive ones, onto the unary costs. This is the alpha that we had in the, in the two-state case, right? So we just add these alphas onto all these unary costs, 
we have these output onto these unary costs, and we can go about our business as before with the same same equations for all of our C our C costs in the middle. The only thing that's happened here that's quite interesting is uh, we've actually because of this reparameterization we don't need CAB one two, and I think we've also gotten rid of CAB four five. Right, there's no four five needed anymore because CAB uh, 4 or 5 is basically wrapped up in here. So it's a slightly simpler graph now after the reparameterization, which is sort of a, a, a nice side effect. So now we know, as long as our cost function was convex, that we can deal with multiple discrete labels. All right. Now, uh, we've already seen the submodularity slides where we're saying, okay, the CAB has to stay positive, for it to stay positive, that the, what, it, what CAB equals, right, these four terms have to, in total, be greater than zero. We said that that corresponds for any four labels, um, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. We need it to sort of have this kind of shape. This is the, the visualization in 2D. Yes? Um, this class, because uh, this multi-labeled thing, so would you do that, for example, if you have a grayscale image? Could, could you expand that to 256 labels, or would it get too complex? You can have 256 labels. You can have quite a few labels. So there are some implementations uh, that we use in our own experiments. Um, and we've pushed it as far as 500 or 1,000 labels, and it, it's OK. Let's say it doesn't, we, we, we haven't run out of memory, right? But then, of course, the size of the problem might might uh, eventually impact you. If you have the more labels you have, the more nodes you have. The more nodes, the more edges, and the more edge costs you have to end up summing up. For example, RGB values of two to power twenty-five, uh, thirty-four. Well, right. So if you go into if you go into the thousands or millions, uh, yeah, you're you're. I think you're going to eventually be taxing any any existing computer. So if you are uh, if you are dealing with sort of manageable numbers, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly where the limit is on manageable, but I, I would say, you know, really think about whether you have a thousand unique categories. Um, if, you, if you have more than that, maybe consider that this is the wrong formulation for you. You should be looking at not discrete optimization, but continuous optimization. Yes? Um, mine was also to do with labels. Um, <coughs> do you need to know how many world states there are? Or yes. Is it possible to construct this in such a way that you optimize the world states as well, the number of possible world states? Uh, For instance, with the llama, yeah. we had like a couple of different things that could be in there, like the mountain, the ruins, and the llama. Yes. Um, but then with the child and the hoover, we had like the child, the hoover, the grass, the fence. Yeah. So if we wanted to have uh, a semantic labeling where each each class, each uh, category, corresponded to some let's say meaningful thing, grass, sky, stuff. right? So then you're saying, well, we might have one graph that gets constructed with four different states and another one that has twenty different states. But it, 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 I think along the lines, if you don't know how many. World states are when you start. Mm. You just kind of give it an image, and it kind of goes well. I Unfortunately, I don't have a mechanism. I don't have a mechanism for you to deal with with that. So you you have to hear. You have to know what is sort of k your number of possible world states in advance. Maybe uh, it doesn't soften the blow very much, but it might help that you could have different. But you have to know them. You could have different numbers of world states at different nodes. So you might have A has a choice of three categories and B has a choice of 25 categories for whatever reason, right? These are random variables that we're talking about, so maybe they represent slightly different things. Uh, so you can do that, but you still have to know the, the K for each one. Yes? Uh, A1 and B1 is never connected in the graphs, that's just the position. A1, B1 is never connected. Well, it's connected to the source, uh, and there is a unary cost hanging from it. I mean, the, the, the pairwise cost of them. 
Because there is a PABIJ cost there always. Yeah, so the cost, so I, do we have that in this, in this visualized example? Uh, no, not really. So the cost between A1 and B2 will have to be cut if, uh, <coughs> if we did A1, if the solution was A1, B1. And that cost will include the pairwise cost A1, B1. Okay, so A and J does never go from 1 to, they never start from 1 to 1 in the, in when you're summing up the C cost. Uh, it starts here. You have i from from one to the maximum that a reached. Yeah. So it it so could be that this outer sum is just four i equals one. But b but j can never be one. Uh, j can be one. So Both of them can be one. So what's the cost of i and j equals one? You're going to have c a b one one. Which would be the pairwise cost of a and b one b one. C A B one one. This is a good question. Let's see. One, one. You will cut C A B. You're pointing this out. You're saying if you go across here, you're going to cut C. A, B, 1, 2, and C, A, B, 1, 3. Yeah. So if we look at the equation, you're right. So there's never an explicit C, A, B, 1, 1. But the pairwise term, because it's indexing over J minus 1 and J minus 1, it is able to talk about B being in state one. Do you have I and J? Yeah. So if I say uh, C A, if I cut C A B one two, right? Then I'm going to have P A the pairwise cost between one and one plus the pairwise cost of zero here, right? Because uh, one minus one is zero, and that's defined here to be zero. So we'll have the pairwise cost you wanted plus a bunch of zeros wrapped up in something called CAB12. Yeah? I think it's a, it's a good observation. There's no, there's, when we do this calculation, CABIJ, and we go through and we compute all of them and label all of these edges, because there's no edge between A1 and B1, you'll never have something called CAB11. However, in order to cut horizontally through there and to cut, come out through this edge over here, we will have to cut one, two, three, four C A Bs. Just that all of them are called C A B one, two, one, three, one, four. Um, just to make you said that J can be one, but if you look at the slide pairwise because it says that J equals capital J plus one where capital J is the number of uh, the, that the pixel p takes label j, so that implies that uh, j, small j, never can be 1. Because even if b is 1, then j will be 2. You know, right, so we, we have, uh, no, let's see, j equals j plus 1. Should this be j plus 1? Should it be? You're questioning whether this should be j equals j plus 1 or if it should just be j. I think it should be j plus 1 because we want to get rid of the. the we want to get the submodularity. Sub that's, that's why we're doing that, right? Uh, well, our submodularity, uh, our submodularity is based on our cost function. So what we're seeing here is that if this index is from j equals j plus 1 to k plus 1, then choosing j equals 1, which is the case you're asking for, a1, b1, right, 
would mean that we would have here a 2 all the way up to 2. Because k is, uh, oh, sorry, 5, because we have 5 or something. Right, so 2 to 5. And what this proof is working out is it's saying, OK, if you plug in for j this range from j plus 1 to k plus 1, then the overall total here is going to be the same as the pairwise, the cost that you wanted, pairwise AB for, we said I is 1 and J equals 1. So if you, if you want, we can work through this proof uh, later on. Uh, but th this is, so this is actually correct. We go J plus 1, um, and then these, these negated terms are going to take away the things that, that we didn't care about. And they're going to leave us with just this pairwise cost that we they actually did want pairwise AB11. One, one. OK. Yeah. So yes? Um, sorry. Uh, so this model kind of, the way I understand it is that for any adjacent two labels, you define the unary cost. But for two labels which are not adjacent, so say label one and three, they would be kind of like there would be an infinite cost in the way between them. Is that correct? No. So the first off, unary cost is truly unary. It is only for a single variable. That, that's that's a matter between that variable and its data. It doesn't. It has. It is not influenced in any way by what's happening at the other pixels. Now, to your to your scenario of having a pixel, two pixels, one gets the first gets state A, and the other one gets sorry, the first gets state one. You said, and the other one gets state three. So we're not saying that there's an infinite cost. We're saying that there is, in total, this, this pairwise cost that we want to have applied. But to have this applied, we have to have a whole series of costs called C going between our nodes. Is that uh, that seems unclear, but I, I think I might have to come back to you after after class because I'm I'm worried now that we're going to to try to spill over into next week, which just can't happen. Okay, um, so we've done reparameterization. We've talked about some modularity. We said that some functions are not convex. Is it all over? Does that mean when when we want to use a truncated quad, quadratic or the POS model that we now can't use any of the things we've learned? And it turns out that, well, there's one more trick left, and that's alpha expansion. So we're, we're going to, to use this alpha expansion thing in situations where we have a non-convex, non-submodular cost function. One where, let's talk about disparity, right? That's what motivated us to come back to these slides. We said, uh, yeah, let's say two pixels neighboring each other. Uh, if they're the same disparity, we want to give them zero cost. If they're sort of an intermediate, uh, disparity, we want to give them a bigger cost. But if there's really, really big disparity difference, well, they've already been punished enough, right? So don't don't keep going. Uh, just level, give it a flat cost. So we said that visually, if, if we don't have, uh, if we use only the quadratic function, we get these sort of smooth boundaries. But what if we want sharp boundaries? So now we're going to do, we're going to deal with that case. But I can no longer guarantee that it will be the exact solution. It will be an approximate solution. It's guaranteed to be within a order of um, within an order of two of the absolute solution. But it's approximate. Okay, so please keep that in mind. All right, and the name of it is alpha expansion. It's a very clever trick. We're going to solve this problem with a bunch of iterations. In each iteration, we're going to expand one of the labels. So um, we're dealing with the multi-label case. This is best illustrated here. We're dealing with the multi-label case. There are, uh, what are we saying? Um, well, there's, there's four categories, right? White, yellow, uh, red, and orange. The initial labeling is like this. During our iterations, let's say uh, iteration one, we're going to pick one of the labels. 
and we're going to give it the name alpha. In this case, we picked orange, and we say, you are alpha. All the other labels, you're not alpha. That's your name, not alpha. So we're going to say alpha, not alpha. We're going to do graph cuts, where we're going to decide whether any of the non-alphas should be given the label alpha. In other words, whether you're orange, white, or red, you now have the opportunity to stay, whatever you were, or to become alpha, alpha which is orange in this case. Right? OK. You take it or leave it, that opportunity, and then we finish that iteration, and we go on to the next iteration, and we say, OK, yellow gets to be alpha this time. And yellow then expands where it can. Some pixels stay where they are, and we keep going. Now we pick red as alpha, and everybody else is not alpha, and keep doing that. And we keep doing that until when we pick an alpha, or we try di picking different alphas, nobody changes their mind. Everybody just says, no, I'm happy being what I was. That's alpha expansion. Uh, there are a few constraints on it. So we've already said, well, it's, it's allowing us to deal with things that with cost functions that are non-convex. So this is great. Um, slight, slight constraint on it that the pairwise costs, they can't be anything, right? They can be truncated, um, quadratic, they can be the pulse model, but they have to be some form of a metric. And here are the rules for having a metric. It means that, for our purposes, to have a pairwise cost between two labels, alpha and beta, if it's equal to zero, that implies that alpha is the same label as beta, okay? And vice versa, if you've got two labels that are the same, that means we have to have a pairwise cost of zero between those two, two variables, okay? Previously, we were saying, okay, with the exact solution in the well-behaved case, we are allowing non-zero costs for two labels getting the same, two, two variables getting the same label, remember? And now we're saying, okay, that's not allowed. It really has to be, if it's zero, then we're in this case, and if we're in this case, then it's zero. Second rule for having a metric is that for a pairwise cost, um, it's between alpha and beta. You have to have the same pairwise cost between beta and alpha. And both of those have to be positive. Okay, so not too much of a shock there, right? We were kind of already dealing with that situation. And the extra constraint. Remember, now we have multiple labels. So I have alpha, beta, and gamma. Here we're saying the pairwise cost between alpha and beta has to be less than or equal to the pairwise cost between alpha and something plus the pairwise cost of that something and beta. This is called the triangle inequality constraint. In other words, if you, you could think of it this way, oh, I don't want to draw uh, variables. If you draw three points, we're saying that getting from A to B should be always shorter or in worst case, equal to going A to C and C to B. The direct path should be the minimum or equal to the longer path. So that's our triangle inequality constraint. So any cost function that you use, as long as these rules are obeyed, you can use alpha expansion. Alpha expansion has a bit of um, question about dynamic graphs. A little bit, you were asking about, uh, can, you, can you maybe not know the K? You need to know the K, but there's a little bit of, of creative graph happening here. All right, so I've set it up for you. You've got A, uh, sorry, you've got alpha and not alpha, or you can think of it as anti-alpha, right? We've picked some color to be alpha, and all the rest are, uh, are going to be not alpha. Now, all the rest might be beta or gamma or other things. So let's go through, because there are four cases um, that we have to worry about. All right, the first case. You've got two nodes. Both of them are already alpha. You draw them in this kind of graph without any edges between them. Why? Because they're both alpha. And we just said for this to be a metric, right? 
pairwise cost between alpha and alpha is zero, right? So no pairwise cost between them, that's simple. Next, we might have a situation where, uh, so these are just A, B, C, D, these are a bunch of pixels, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five pixels. We'll get to K in a moment. So between the second and the third pixel, what if this is our, our state, our initial state? So that one's alpha, that one's beta. Well, now we need a pairwise cost. So we make, we make an edge between them, and the pairwise cost, P, BC, between pixel B and pixel C, takes alpha and beta, because it has to be prepared for the situation that alpha and beta have some non-zero cost function between them. Okay, so far so good, right? Nothing, nothing too shocking. All right, uh, so just to keep track down here at the bottom, the adjacent pixels are alpha and beta, so the result after we do this optimization, well this one was alpha, so after alpha expansion, which only expands, it will still be alpha, but after alpha expansion, this thing that was beta could either still be beta, which is why we introduced the edge, or it might become alpha. If it becomes alpha, then there's no pairwise cost here. Okay, so those are the two possible outcomes of this case, case two. So we're going to just keep going. Now we're looking at pixels C and D. C and D started off as beta and beta. So the possible outcomes after optimizing beta and beta, right? They might both reject the label alpha, so they would just stay what they are. They were both beta, so what's the pairwise cost between them? Zero, right? So they, they don't need an edge uh, for that. But one of them could join alpha, or the other one might join alpha. And depending on which one, you have to be prepared and have a pairwise cost alpha beta or a pairwise cost beta alpha. And so both of those, both of those are introduced here. Sorry, I'm getting 30 books from guy outside. All right, uh, fourth, fourth case. This is the hardest one. Now we have pixels beta and gamma for D and E. Now, this is slightly tricky because before they were beta beta, which meant that if nothing changed, their pairwise cost was zero. But now, if nothing changes, they still have a pairwise cost, damn it. So what do we do with that? Well, we had to introduce this extra k here, this extra variable k, uh, which sits in between. And so, sorry, which sits in between. And because of that, we have these new pairwise edges. Pairwise d, e with beta alpha, pairwise d, e with alpha gamma. And we have to have this k, which is p, d, e, beta gamma. So that's this beta gamma that we just added. We had to add this node k, and we had to add this edge attached to the sink. So that's the, the weird sort of anomalous thing. The other two edges, sets of edges, are added as shown. And with that, you're, you're ready to roll. So you have this state. You introduce those edges. I have an extra here, too. OK, great. I'll be out in just a minute. OK. Thanks. All right. Example cuts through the system, but you get the idea. You have to reconfigure your graph after each alpha expansion iteration. OK, so that's, that's the sneaky part about it. Uh, example cuts, don't forget the triangle inequality. And the result, final application I'll show, are denoising with multiple labels, right? You can have a non-convex cost function, and after one iteration, two iterations, three iterations, four iterations, each one, alpha is choosing either the trousers or the shoes or the color of the hair, right? And expanding just that label. Eventually, you end up with a nice denoised image. Okay. I'll send out a message about chapter 13. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to read big parts of it. Uh, they don't have to be read for next week, but they will have to be read for the exam. Um, SIP in particular will be needed for next week, but I'll send a message out telling you about that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes.